What's going on, guys? This is Semi Limited Podcast. I'm your boy, Player X. I'm Dylan. And we are here with our special guest tonight, who is a local Market Watch cat, who I have found on YouTube. Uh, but he was actually, I say local, but he's been all over. I want you guys to give it up for the white Mexican, a.k.a. Antonio. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Absolutely. We'd love to have you on. So, you want to give a little bit about yourself, what you do, plug your YouTube channel in, give a little bit of the self-plug thing before we start getting into this? Of course. So, I have been in the hobbies. Initially, I started when the game dropped in 2002, and I collected and played until about early to mid-2004, and then I basically just kept on my cards but stopped playing until... The summer of 2011 is when I came back, and then I've been going strong ever since 2011, pretty consistently. And in 2018, 2019 was when I decided to start a YouTube channel, and it revolves primarily around market watches, and it's really, it's really fun stuff. So I like to make videos about Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, it's actually how I remember meeting you, actually. I, I followed you because I was tired of watching. Uh, so I, I if, when I watch my market watches, I listen to uh, House of Champs. I sometimes listen to M. Cole 40. I like Nishi from MSTV a lot. And if there was nothing else to listen to, there's this guy uh, named MSK. And I only listen to him because he sometimes had some good cards that he talked about but i just could not tolerate him like as far as like his him as a person so i was just looking for more people and i stumbled across your uh your little thumbnail and your tags and i'm like you know what this guy seems pretty cool so it, what really got me hooked on your market watches which i think will probably hook everyone else to is the your fact that you say uh bones instead of dollars i think that's you say 25 bones or like three bones or this is a less than a bone and I think that that's funny as hell. I, I love it. Like, it's just very, like, genuine. It's original. So I was like, damn, this guy's calling everything Bones. It's kind of like, it reminded me of my dad almost. So I was like, yo, I kind of like this guy. Let me, let me let me follow him. Let me give him a subscribe. And then I remember an episode of you saying that you were coming to Syracuse. And I had to comment in the comment section. I'm like, oh, bro, like, I'm from Syracuse. So, you know, let's, let's get on that. You know, let's link up. Yes, the whole Bones thing has become somewhat of a trademark for the channel. Um, and... Yeah, it's, uh, you know, everyone's got their little little things here and there they like to use. Mm -hmm. So have you always been, like, into the market watch for Yu-Gi-Oh? Or are there any other, like, uh, like markets that you're into, like stocks or, like, other TCGs or anything? So a quick history as far as, like, strictly Yu-Gi-Oh market watches on the YouTube platform. Um, I didn't even know that Yu-Gi-Oh had market watches until it was either early... Uh, late 2016 or early 2017 because at the time I was in the military and I was stationed in South Korea and I stumbled upon um, House of Champs as well. House of Champs was the first Yugi Tube Market Watch Yu-Gi-Oh channel I'd ever seen. Uh, it kind of opened the whole Market Watch world to me uh, wide open and then shortly after just finding him I found uh, now it's Yu-Gi-Oh! Paisano, but he used to be... Yeah, Paisano. He used to be VCTRFSS. And I just loved him. Like, I loved his humor. I loved his... I don't know. I just... I really... He, he really opened up for me. And, you know, I, as soon as I started following yeah, him, I, I completely just stopped watching... Yeah, very I genuine, completely yeah. stopped watching House of Champs. And then I just, you know, religiously watched... Uh, v and then he was the channel I can say confidently like VCTRFS or Yu-Gi-Oh! Paisano was the YouTube channel that yeah inspired me to to make my own YouTube channel because yeah he had really great stuff yeah that's what's up I really do like Pais Paisano I, I watched him since before he even had a webcam when he was just doing the uh the audio over the like OBS screen recording and uh I was always a fan like he he, sp he speaks his mind. He, he sometimes is a little bit, a uh, little political for my taste. I kind of like staying with just the cards, but you know, it, it, like you said, he does, it does add an entertainment value to it. So like, you know, he's a, and he's a cool guy. I've never seen him down speak anyone that uh, I think has like 
said anything derogatory or anything like that. I've never seen him like go after like the regular person. He's if he's going after someone, it's because you know they've in his eyes done him wrong, which I can at least understand. But at the same point, I'm here. I'm here for the cards, guy. I'd be telling myself the same thing with uh, House of Champs when uh, he'd be showcasing his merch. And, or not his merch, but like his uh, sponsors' merchandise and you know clips and pins and all this stuff. And I'm like, ah, eh, get to the cards. I'm here for the cards, guy. I've never really been into the market watches, which is crazy. Like I, I, I respect the hustle of it, but uh, my origins with that is I've never. I remember the first time like going to a regional, and I saw like a, a vendor like just like you know a, a app. They do it on the side like vending and they're buying just stacks of cards for like thousands of dollars and that was my first like big eye opener like holy fuck like oh there's more markets than just tcg player you know what i mean like the facebook market and all that but uh, i respect the hell out of people who can track it it's just the algorithm it's just like the stocks and shit so definitely respect for that i mean as far as me, I've always kind of really been into the market watches. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just like the Jewish in me. But like, I penny pinch a lot. <laughs> I penny pinch a lot. So if I can go to locals and I can trade, like, random cardboard for like money for value for cards that people are gonna actually spend money on instead of just trade for, I just kind of saw that as like an opportunity to like make a quick like little buck. And I kind of just like got more and more into it. Like the more I started doing it, I don't it's know. Like, it's a huge thrill. Yeah, yeah it really you, is. Yeah, it is. When you make come up, yeah, when you oh. make it come up, it's crazy. Like, uh, off the top of your head, Antonio, do you remember the most you've ever made off of a, a card flip? Like bought at the lowest and sold at the highest. Um, I think so. Something that comes to mind of late that I can remember was when Tier Elements dropped and they started getting really popular towards the end of this summer, uh, last summer. There was this card called um, Earth Shadowing. Earth Shatter. Oh, Earth Shattering event. Yes, and um, I don't know if it still is, but at the time it was a solo print Prismatic Secret out of World Superstars, which was a really random yeah. subset. And I actually bought like probably like no joke like 200 copies like near mint the first Woo! but this was like way back like you know when i first started my channel one of the very first uh market watches that i ever produced on my youtube channel uh it was you know it was kind of like a, like a showcasing exclusive i did because back then in 2018 you know at the time uh at the time it was you know a one dollar point five of a dollar card so i witnessed it no i remember it was like two or three dollars when you showcased it it was you know a solo print it was prismatic and i just thought it was really neat you know um so that was probably one of the more bigger recent recent did you ever cash out when it was that ten? i did i don't i don't have i don't have any left i i sold them all to but that's what you love to hear people <laughs> and it, it wasn't all like it was yeah mostly tcg player but it was also some in person too and some were just went straight to trade value i mean you can proc three those for 30. yeah absolutely when they're when they're at 13 14 15 yeah absolutely. so that was that was one thing that was really um really nice and then also of late too or at least uh a couple months ago i always bulk buy i like hoarded the crap out of the Duos Genesis uh, special edition super rare promos of Eradicator Virus. Okay. It was the the special edition for Duos Genesis. Okay, yeah. And those those were quite popular uh, a couple months back. They are going for like 5, 7, 10. I think they went all the way up to 15 at like the very highest. And I had like 50 of those. So I sold all of them slash traded sold all of them except for three i just kept a play set to to play with with my dark world so that was another thing that was you know and it, and it works out it's not always like that those are like the big, bigger successes that are just you know kind of random but you know every once in a while that happens if you have like a base understanding and kind of like a nose for where, where the market's kind of going yeah for the market i got i got accidentally lucky uh like one of my first months into the game i went to this like underground card shop and there was a raw sphere mode and i just bought it because i was like oh like this is cool like this is, has to do with wing dragon of raw like i'm new like these things are dope to me yeah and i got dude i got it for like fucking 50 cents if even and it was when they were at like 90 dollars 
And that was like, I was so new to the game. I was like, holy fuck. Holy shit. Are you telling me that this is 90? Yeah, yeah, bro. Like, well, that was, whoa. And then I, uh, I, so I sold it and then I bought Zoo right before it got banned. So instantly it was gone. Poof. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, bro. So, uh, yeah, that was a sweet experience, uh, when I was brand new to the game. So, <laughs> I remember picking up, uh, what was it called? Ross Disciple Secrets. I have a page and a binder that I don't really trade or sell out of. It's just like a personal collection, like just lore binder. And so I have all the gods and I have like all of the cards that are related to the gods. And one of them was Raw's Disciple. So I bought a place out of Raw's Disciple. Look at it was secret rare, just the like highest rarity. The shit was like 50 cents, bro. No more. Couldn't be more than 75 cents a pop. And then fast forward to now where Branded is using the Raw's Disciple to lock people. And that spiked to about ten dollars, and I was like, instantaneously, Austin, do you want a raw that's secret? Because I have three of them, and I got them for seventy-five cents. Oh, we got lucky with the reprint and the god structures. Yeah, yeah you kind of were, but you know, the the secret kind of retained its value, so I'm I'm fine with that. Oh, but I yeah. guess the highest the highest flip I ever made was, I am a really big advocate for Cyber Dragons, mm -hmm. as most people know. So I had uh, OG first edition ulti cyber dragons from uh cybernetic revolution and i held on to those for like the longest i had like like very light play copies at, at, the, at most but they were really 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 good copies and I, I i got them each for like maybe two maybe 250 so i, I spent no more than like 750 on these cards and for some reason i don't remember what it was but they were just super spiking. They were. It was like maybe three three weeks before the uh, announcement of the OTS reprint of the, uh, the OT Dragon. They were at like something about like 1,200, 1,300 each. And I had decided to finally pull the trigger and sell them. And I sold the playset for I think like maybe like sh just shy of three grand. It was like maybe 2750, 28 something like that so i turned 700 dollars into about 2700 dollars, and that felt really good because I, I was although i missed them and i complained for the next two or three weeks when i had to go buy secrets then the ots ulties got announced and then this the ghost got announced and i'm like oh we, we're not missing nothing three bands in your fucking pocket from that hell yeah so i was like all right yeah we're, we're coming oh, up baby shit. and that's what it's funny i took that money and i got the uh equipment for this podcast so you know god's plan you gotta put it somewhere so i'm glad i pulled the trigger and did that but that was probably the most the biggest come up i probably made in uh, a Yu-Gi-Oh investment i would say it's always really difficult when you like so when you have a deck that you really really love that you've had for such a long time and you know it's all max rarity and then it, it spikes up like crazy amounts and the investor side of you is like okay like i need to sell this while it's high and then i can just rebuy it for cheaper later on when it goes back down yeah that jewish side comes out man that was like the same thing with me like the last couple months you know before the new dark world structure that came out some of the dark world prices were going pretty crazy like hype prices and you know i had almost three complete sets of like max rarity dark world stuff like everything first alties oh yeah i remember seeing them. and and i really you know i was you know and i've been hoarding the deck for years because uh, you know dark world was one of my longest standing favorite you know decks um but the prices were just going crazy for the high-end stuff so i ended up selling like about like pretty much everything that i had except for a playset of everything max rarity that that you know i just kept that for myself one play set of everything uh in max rarity and you know i was that was really hard yeah like even though like i made you know like close to damn near like almost i think like two like two grand yeah but just like passing those cards off that you've been holding on to it's just like uh, i don't want to that's always a that's always a hard hard painful choice right there that's like Dil that's like dylan giving up tunes right now yeah, bro, that's, so that's the only fucking thing I collect, like, in Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, I could, like, if it, I just, you know, I came in and, uh, Link, so to me, I like collecting cards like this is, like, besides, like, the shit I played when I was a kid, like, I still got all that. So, you know, the first couple sets, but, like, I don't give a fuck, like, collecting-wise, like, that besides Toons, like, that, I fuck with Toons. Yeah, Toons is his baby. Got the binder. The Toon World binder. 
glossed out with the high rarity, <laughs> secret rare Toon Dragons or Toon Blue Eyes. Yeah, this man's blossom. Oh, I t I'm a, I, yeah, that's that's gotta be a purchase. Purchase the first steps. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely oh. a purchase. But that that kind of drinks us into our next section of the value of old cards versus the value of new cards. Like, some people would say that these new cards that we get, like the high rarity ones, the high like are crazy in value. Like, uh, there are cards that are well over a thousand dollars themselves that used to not be. Uh, in the same way with old school cards too, there are so many cards that used to be maybe five or six dollars because they just weren't nothing that just suddenly become meta relevant and just start spiking in price or just retaining their value because they're just such hard collector's cards to get to. Uh, do you have, uh, what, what are some picks that you think, uh, Antonio, that worth like just the old cards that you can compare to like new cards that might like have crazy high value just because of either scarcity or maybe like a meta play tech or like you do you think of any cards that uh would compare to like new age cards um yes so um i would say to me in particular i mean i'm my priority is collecting like i'm very much a, a collector first and a player kind of second i there's certain aspects that i love from both sides that's what's so great about this hobby is there's so many different ways that you can approach it and you can be more than just like you know a competitive player or more than a casual or more than just a collector uh, as far as like what i consider generation one kind of like dual monsters era lob through rds the first 13 core sets i would say like right now the first thing that comes to mind that is just like aesthetically just amazing and ridiculously expensive um and just really really cool to have is the magic ruler first edition secret rare tomb blue eyes white dragons that card is My just hat. insane for collectability purposes and has been for quite some time and it's an yeah. extremely liquid um card on the market i mean people talk about dd blue eyes you know the promo prismatics about how liquid that is and how easy that is to push that card around and it very much is but first edition original secret uh Tomb Blue Eyes is almost just as liquid. It's like five hundred dollars, something like that, right? It is. It's it's around there. It's around. I don't. I, Even the non uh, first editions are up there in price too. Really, unlimbs. Unlimbs are are crazy. Yeah, they're like they're like ninety to a hundred. That's for, insane. Uh, near moons. I have. Them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was like two summers ago. It was like right after maybe like a year and a year and a half after moving here to Syracuse, I was able to pick up two copies, two first edition secrets, original prints offline from uh, a player. I'm still like in like shock that I spent so much money on just two cards, but I am, I'm very, very thankful. How much did you spend? I did not spend any less than probably seven or eight that's that's not so. bad that's not bad i that's not bad at all but that's probably over time that's probably over time gonna net you about another two grand in in my eyes i feel as though like at, at the rate at which is it's going I, and especially for cards I, I i don't know if you agree or disagree but i really do feel as though older cards are more valuable or they i kind of even like say set the standard at near mint conditions like no one wants an lp an lp or a mod play collector card like if you're kind of gonna pay that money for you're gonna shell out the money for a good card uh or an investment i would feel as though you'd only want near men or bust so yeah that was very much my mentality you know as this game you know continues to get older and you know it, it's it's you know over two decades old now so i mean it's very much a well-seasoned tcg here oh, i used to really have that mentality because you know 10 you know, ten, eight, five years ago, you you could you could pick up you know, uh, original first edition near mint Chaos Emperor dragons for like fifty to forty five bucks. You know, you could pick up like original. But I remember like one thing like insane like this was again like when I was overseas in twenty fourteen. I was picking up near mint first edition 
Lightly played, Seeker Rare, Legacy of Darkness, Injection Fairy Lilies for fourteen bucks. Oh wow, like fourteen. That's crazy. You know, I I was buying them like left and right, like for for years, like literally, like all my lilies like span from like twenty fourteen to probably twenty sixteen. Those two years, I was just went hard. I was ripping lilies for like fourteen between fourteen to like twenty range, like for two years straight, and that's why I have so many because getting stuff early like it, it, it's kind of it's it's hard because you know it's hard to get stuff early because you don't really know where the market's going but that is one card that i remember like discreetly like it's just insane like if you can you can go back like two three years the prices were so much lower it's crazy yeah i mean but like i, I feel as though it's kind of like a high risk high reward especially or i feel as though when i market watching and i invest in crazy high cards because like there's times where uh like even for recent I play Cash Tira, and uh, a tech card that they play is Air Neos because it's a level seven wind monster that you could bring out under the barrier statue that uh, instant contact can special summon. So it became a card that was played in a meta relevant deck. But Air Neos, as you know, it hasn't been reprinted in like, I don't know, like 20 years or something like that. So it's just an expensive card that just sees somewhat meta relevant play currently. That is just spike crazy up because it's just a solo print. It's a collector's card. No one has it. I think I bought a mod play one for like sixty dollars the other day. It was unlimited just to have the card. But even when Cash Tier is not playing it. So if that goes into the next OTS pack as a collector, do you hate to see that or do you like to see that? I don't know. I feel as though I'd like to see it because like I, I mean, I mean like, of course I, I invested in the it. The comments are like high as fuck, and then they give you like a super or something. So you're not liking that. Yeah, if they give us a super, I'm not liking that. I'm mad as fuck. I just spent because I would have rather spent <laughs> the five ten dollars for whatever the super is gonna be, than the sixty dollars that is spent. Especially if it's just to get played for two months, and then I dump the cards within the deck. Because we're not playing that in the next format. Post hype hypernova like cash tier gets godly good, and it's gonna be cutting all the stuff that it has right now. So like I bought that card because I know that. It's played in a deck right now that I kind of want to play and I want to tech that card in, but also that when it, we're done with it and I put it into a binder, it's also going to retain its value. Like, it's just those older cards, like, because of how co their conditions are, like, the more near mint condition it is, I feel as though the more you can kind of, you know, press that premium button and get top notch for, you, for that card. But that's just me. That's just me, though. Also, we have new card announcement so that kind of brings us into this topic which is power creep within old cards and the new cards uh i don't know if i have heard of the new synchro monster that just got announced uh it's called i think chaos angel i read a snippet on one of the Yu-Gi-Oh facebook groups but other than that i didn't like fully like oh we're gonna fully read this bitch this bitch is crazy dylan did you read this card yet oh yeah yeah i read it so very all right before we reread it again, off your, off just your post thoughts because of, of how good this card is. Zero out of ten. Zero being dumped that bitch. Ten being played in every extra deck period, no matter what the cost. What do you think it is? Uh, you need to get the full effect. It's light and dark, but it's so generic and it's a level ten. Uh, so. I think a lot of decks are going to be played that can go... I mean, you don't even need a tuner for it, right? So you're saying at least above an 8. I'd, I'd feel comfortable with this at a 7, but 8? I mean... If, if we're stupid. putting Pepega Ruler at 10, do you think this is as strong or weaker or stronger than Pepega For the Ruler? time? Oh, I mean, that card was very important very good uh i'd say this is like on the level of like uh baron baron Wrong. before okay mm -hmm. okay i'll give you that i'll give you that so for for those who don't know what the card says this is chaos angel it's a level 10 dark fiend synchro type effect monster with 3500 attack and 2800 defense its materials are one tuner and one non-tuner light or dark monster the effect of this card states, for this card's Synchro Summon, you can treat one light or dark monster you control as a tuner, which is fucking insane. If this card is Special Summon, does not say Synchro Summon, if this card is Special Summon, you can target one card on the field, banish it. 
That's insane. Another effect is if this this card gains the effects based on the original attributes of the materials used for its synchro summon. So it'll gain these effects off because one of them has to be a light or a dark for its summon. So if you use the light monster, synchro monsters you control are unaffected by your opponent's activated monster effects, which is lit. Synchro monsters, not just itself, all your synchro monsters. And then if, if you use the dark monster for its summon, your monsters cannot be destroyed by battle, forcing them to have to destroy them by card effects or disrupt them in any way. But your synchros are going to be <laughs> unaffected by your opponent's activated monster effects. So, Antonio, what do you think about that card? Just reading it off the rip just now. I mean, it goes without saying, you know, every player, or at least, you know, every player should know that Dark and Light always have the most endless pools of card pulls like they they have so much support if you go back through all the different metas through all the history of this game some of the biggest decks have been light and dark based and for sure that's part of the chaos era. yeah you know i mean just you know yeah infamous cookie cutter chaos era you know i mean that was even gen one like you know the first couple years of the game like the, the reason why like there was a ban list was because of like chaos emperor dragon the whole chaos mechanic i mean like back then to drop a beater for essentially nothing and then also have spot removal and all this like follow-up plays was just you know literally so game breaking that it created the ban list i mean the yada loop was more like what kind of sealed the deal but chaos emperor dragon was very much a signature piece of that combo um but the that was uh that was going right from uh just a regular beatdown era right into actually thinking about uh how to play the game a little bit more like combo wise yeah so as soon as invasion of chaos dropped uh that that completely broke the game uh the speed of the game went from like a snail's pace to like it, it was just really like the games were ended in like two or three turns which was like unheard of like that had never been a thing before um but kind of going back to just it's so generic again th there's so many options for light and dark builds and the sheer fact that you don't necessarily even need like a hard printed tuner um it's 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 definitely going to be used it's definitely going to be you know accessible so i think that i don't know i think that's pretty much i don't really know what else to say yeah, I mean, no, I, I feel I like it's, it's going to be very, weakness. very accessible. Its only weakness is its weakness to uh, green cards uh, that can just get rid of it. And but purple cards. That, purple cards, too. Okay, you can hit it with... Yeah, you can hit right. it with an Imperm. You know, say like nothing's stopping it. But, like, the fact that it banishes a card on summon, and that says special summon. So, not only could you banish oh, yeah, it on the special summon, it's not just... You exactly. Anything. You can, like, banish it and then bring it back. You can send it to the graveyard, Monster Reborn it back, and you can then banish another card on the field. That's crazy to me. Like, I think that that's insane. That it just, like... Because it should say, like, during Synchro Summon, like, when this card is Synchro Summon, like, only once, when you bring this out, you can banish a card. But this just says Special Summon. So, it is, I just know it's going to get abused in some way, shape, or form. I just I can just tell. But that also leads us to the power creep, I think, of how Yu-Gi-Oh! kind of has been. Like, you look at Synchro Monsters from back then, kind of like Drill Warrior, uh, Goyo Guardian, uh, that are just, like, impactful for their metas. And then now you look at Synchro Monsters now, and you're like, God, what is this? This is just absurd. This is it's ignorant. Yes, I definitely think that synchros i mean by far i mean if you look at the statistics i think it's safe to assume the majority of players favor synchro for their extra deck monsters ever since synchros came out which was i believe i think uh i don't know five d's or something like that it you know they were in they're an instant hit i mean they're aesthetically gorgeous especially in you know ghost and ultimate they they look really really good uh, they're fun. The whole idea behind tuners was like just new and really thought provoking and just, you know, it was just fun. It was a really fun mechanic and completely changed the game. Um, when XYZs came, I mean, they were so easy and so generic and a lot of people didn't like them because they're like, oh, this is way too powerful. 
um, and there wasn't really kind of a lot of like tactics. You didn't really have to think about X, Y, Z's. And then I feel like everything after X, Y, Z's and on, it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's not really a whole lot of forward thinking where synchros, you definitely have to think a little bit more and kind of plan ahead. And I think that's why there's it's a big fan favorite. I can definitely agree with that. Like, I definitely think that synchros are the most generic of the extra decks. Like, XYZs require two specific monsters. Uh, fusions require usually two specific or at least one specific monster. Although some, some synchros require tuners, now we're coming into a day and age where, like, these harder mechanics are just becoming easier and easier to break. It's just like with, uh, it, it's a total boost. Just like with uh, Drytron helping out Ritual Summon. It's changed the whole dynamic exactly like being able to ritual summon off of a material off of another monster that's a crazy it's idea cool. yeah it's cool seeing them like power creep or power crap older shit to be more playable so do you like that like because we, we were in time where like now fusion monsters you could just send from the extra oh. deck like, now synchro monsters you don't even fucking need a tuner anymore like what like you know what i'm saying xyz's can be xyz summoned with just one monster Oh yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> Zeus and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, oh, well, even new new wave cash Tira, you can bring out a rise heart with just one monster. Like, well, that's... to be fair though, I mean, links are obnoxiously easy to go into generic, and then you can link climb into a monster with a crazy effect. So I think you really have to like, y you have to do that shit. I think like what contact fusion was the first like upgrade to something for like fusion shit to make it easier. Oh, I think it was Shadal fusion so too. Like, uh, or brilliant Br brilliant fusion one? or should all fusion i don't remember which one the, the, they were both the first ones to start sending from the deck to the graveyard but i'm pretty sure it was brilliant first i think they, they uh, covenanted the garnet yeah uh but i think uh links changed the way that the game is played obviously um i guess that's true because the way i sometimes look at link monsters is like let's say we have four monsters on field so not only are you going to eventually make a link for like let's just say access cold taco or something like that uh but you can use the effects of the monsters that are link summoned up to its climb so like yeah you're going to end on a monster that will pop three cards and uh swing for 5300 but the link three that brought out beforehand is going to spin a card on the field to the like back to the deck and then the link two that was brought out before that is going to be a nightmare monster, which is going to pop a monster or or a back row. You know what I'm saying? So not only did you just link climb with four monsters into popping like five, uh, almost six cards, and then spinning a card back, but now you're putting a 5300 attack monster on the board, and like I, that's how I think of link monsters is not only like the the boss that you bring out, but like the effects that you do along the way. Like it's all those effects going into it so i do agree that links are kind of more by far more crazier than any other mechanic do so do you think that we're power creeping other mechanics to catch up to links yeah for sure to keep everybody interested and keep everybody happy like he said like synchros are beloved by a lot of the older school guys so you gotta you gotta keep everyone happy you know if you want the game to continue i think i will say though about like the power creep specifically on the topic of synchros i mean you know when synchros first came out you saw some of the most like legendary like noteworthy ones were like stardust dragon black rose dragon um glaio guardian like those were like the most busted synchros for so long you know at their prime someone busted those out you know you're like um, like how am i gonna get rid of this you know and now now there's synchros that and it's not just synchros in general but i feel like the new power crap is all about negates like when something new comes out it has to have some kind of like sense of like severe like deprivating control and negates oh, for sure i hear you. yeah like look at baron look at like Borload, savage dragon all the stuff that tears do all yeah, like, and that, that's, like, one thing I really don't like about the direction of the game and the new stuff. Like, I love that there's constantly new products coming out, and we are just constantly getting more pools of cards to build our decks and do all these different things. But as far as, like, the meta goes, like, when was the last time that we had an Uprising deck that didn't, like, solely rely on negating and controlling? Like, 
establishing a board and basically just holding that board until you win and that's like i don't know it's just kind of like, yeah i feel that yeah it's kind of all the same like i kind of feel like it's like cursed to just be power crept and power crept and power crept and whoever can get the most negates on board first to basically make your opponent run out of resources as opposed to like you actually like building a board to actually like combat and fight and actually like attack with monsters and destroy things and it's not really about that anymore it's all about yeah, no, like who can that, get yeah. the negates on the board first do you, and i i don't know so do you so do you feel as though like we're creeping too fast with the power or do you feel as though like we need to, like so like should we stop printing cards to slow the game down like I, I don't know maybe give more time between core sets and side sets so we're not getting four or five core sets eight side sets a deck builder pack a legendary duelist you know what i'm saying like or do you feel as though we should stop printing as powerful cards so fast i mean i i personally would would love if we didn't if we didn't get like so many new sets so fast like i i'm it's kind of mixed because i like getting new sets and like researching new cards and like figuring out what like you know trying to figure out what the next best thing is going to be even though it's pretty predictable like you know there's we have the internet we have the resources to kind of figure out we have the ocg format to kind of look forward to and their ban list and everything but there we have so much like this game this game has been around for over two decades we have so many different decks we have so many different things that we can do um and it kind of it konami will never do it because they're always going to print cards and more and like the next best thing and the, the most the next strongest thing and the next best thing because that's what prints them money that's what makes them they're very much a business and every business needs to make money and needs to be profitable to grow and get bigger be more successful and all that so it's not really going to happen they're not going to slow down production if you look at like you know even even beyond like playability purposes or enjoyment for the competitive game like the the card quality is going down like so terribly like yeah i, I agree i agree with that completely you look at the like they're pumping stuff out so fast like the last product that i bought the last sealed product i bought was the dark world structure deck the new one that came out in december and the, those like the north american ones not for some reason not it's you know the europe i because i got euro english ones and then i bought and i opened and i did a comparison between the north american structure deck and the euro english the euro english was fine uh, they you know belgium or the uk or whatever they're printed they must have it going on but the ones that i got at walmart here from north america they were like literally like so thin like so cheap we're talking like pages in a bible thin like such crap quality like you could flick the card and it would like bend like it was it could you can tell that they're pushing out so much product so fast that they're skimping they're skimping on the cardboard stock and it's just i don't it's i, I don't like it yeah honestly when they were going in an age i remember back when the uh, covid hit and they were postponing sets because they couldn't print sets fast enough. And in my eyes, I was like, well, that's kind of good. Like, we, sh we need to push these back. Let's enjoy the metas that we're in. I feel as though the, the meta shifts every every day. Technically, there's a new tech card or a new uh, strategy being found out or a new way to abuse a certain card. But, like, we don't ever just sit back and enjoy a format. It's always just like, all right, well, this one, so how do we make it better? How do we make it better? It's like, we're not making anything new. We're just making things better. It's like, you know, we, we I think we should just kind of cool back off that. That theory, that theory comes as a double-edged sword, though. Like, what if we get stuck in a tier zero format for too long? Like, yeah, But that's why we have the ban list. That's the thing. Like, they could change, if they wanted to, they could change the ban list rotation. They could make the ban list, like, every three months or every two months like if they wanted to they really could control the meta with just the ban list alone they don't need to push out all these products and make like the next big thing the next big thing the next big thing they won't because that's what makes them momentum and makes them money but if they really wanted to there's more than enough card pool for people to have a lot of tons of fun formats and just being regulated by the ban list and just making the ban list more frequent and that would be fine i personally believe that i mean now that's just my personal thing maybe not everyone would enjoy that but i feel that they could very much make a lot of really 
long-lasting, fun, diverse formats by just regulating it with the ban list and slowing down on new product production. But like you said, I totally agree with you, Dylan. Like it, it is a double-edged sword, and not everyone thinks the same way that I do. No, I can I can at least understand it or wrap my head around that. Dylan, do you think that the ban list or the ever changing or ever updating card pool is what's power creeping the formats the most? Like, do you think if we were to unrelease cards from the ban list that it would shake up the game faster than if Konami were to print these absolutely absurd cards? Or do you feel like we need these new cards because cards in the have had to take a step back out of the formats by being put on the ban list and they need to be replaced by stronger cards well so what are we 25 years in right it's the 25th anniversary oh, just about yeah 25th anniversary yeah so i mean eventually it's all got to be printed right like there's no way to they've already took such a big step forward that you, you can't go back unless yeah there's like there's more there's well over ten thousand cards so like one way that Pokemon gets around this uh, is they have the rotation. So, like, there'll be a card that's kind of like, you know, like, there's, like, a Monster Reborn or something, but it'll be rotated out, but then there'll be another card that kind of is, is like it, you know, but gives, like, another deck a chance. But uh, I, I couldn't see Yu-Gi-Oh! going that route, so I think you just have to keep going and get the next best thing. Did you, so do you think that the ban list has an influence more over the meta or that the card pool in being updated every other three weeks has a better impact on the meta? Uh, I I have to go with the latter there and say the next best thing because, I, I mean, it, it, they both get affected by that, you know, because for the Titan to die, you know, mm. It usually gets hit by the ban list, but sooner or later there'll be another big, you know, dick swinging deck in town. Well, that's what I'm, well, that's what I'm saying. What do you think is is affecting just just the format itself? I'd have to say the new cards. You think that new cards being released, like how strong these new cards are coming out, is what's affecting the meta more than if we were to re unrelease cards like Den Long, like Snatch Steel, like if you if like, like if Konami were to just unban every banned card right now. Do you think that that would change the meta up more? We would be in more chaos than if Konami were to print 16 synchros that say you don't even need a fucking tuner for this or 18 spell cards that say fusion from the from the deck, but you could send whatever you could send one specific card and then any other fucking card from your deck or any card that says normal summon one monster and XYZ over it because you just need one monster for it if you're just you know what i'm saying like, like if you're going everything off the ban list that will wait be way more effective well i'm not saying everything but i'm just saying this ban list have more influence over the meta than a new card coming out i mean for instance like right now like macrocosmos and shit coming back like yeah that fucking influenced the meta pretty big you know you know i feel that like people are playing around that for sure but to that same standpoint we just in the next format are about to get a rice heart which can be special summoned over one material and its permanent effect blanket says every card that's sent to the graveyard is banished it's a it's a macro cosmo that can be brought out with one monster you know what i'm saying so like is that more crazy than releasing three macro cosmos like i said uh I, before like i think the new cards coming out is what defines the meta because Tears came out a little bit ago, and then Ashizu came out, and look where we're at. It was tier zero. That's true. So I, I, I have to pick that. No, that's true. I, I can I can stand behind that argument. But I, I also so they, do feel as though like that comes off the ban list, yeah. And then uh, you're like, all right. What yeah, about you, Antonio? Awesome. Do you feel as though like the ban list has a bigger influence, or that the uh, the card pool has a bigger influence? Well, one thing I could say, I definitely don't think that it's a good idea for Konami just to shotgun the ban list and unlock everything because that would literally just lead to a lot of OTKs and no one wants OTKs. Am I the only one who wants anarchy? <laughs> you ever been, you ever, you ever been, after, yeah, one turn killed and you're going second and you still lose No, like, I don't, I don't because we have turn. cards like Imperm and Ash Blossom, but that's just me. That's just me. I want anarchy. I want everything no, to come off the list and just say, just for a format. I'm not saying we do it forever, but I'm just saying unban everything and just see what the fuck happens. Because there's going to be so much shit going on, we're not even going to be able to record it all. It's kind of like, 
And not everyone wants to play the same deck. I feel as though we're kind of shoehorned into playing these decks because you have to play the cards to compete. But if we could unban anything and you wanted to play an FTK, that's cool. But now just know that Max C's out, that there's uh, Ash Blossom's out, Bell's out, uh, Lancey is a whole blanket thing. You know what I'm saying? Like all these other cards are going to be out too. So like that degeneracy that used to work back then kind of wouldn't, I don't think would work now. Oh, uh, they're the most recent one that I played. There's been a couple more. Was the uh, pendulum um, hero one where you use like a bunch of night cards too and shit. And I brought that to a regional, and people were ready to fucking throw hands when you f do that full combo and you first turn kill them. Uh, yeah, but like meta wise, I think what that's was all worth... that would be played for sure. But that's what that's because of what was the card pool allowed you to do at no, that there was, time. No, that was when Ash Blossom was a thing. That was when Imper. Well, yeah, just Ash Blossom, my nigga. Now we got like no, there's Ghost Ash Ghost Blossom. Ghost. We got yeah, like we're all there. Yeah, just because three of them are there doesn't mean we have like cards like Dark Ruler no more. Cards like Evenly Matched. Cards like Lightning Storm. That you know what I'm saying? I'm like those, you're, you're dead before you get a turn. Nah, fuck that. <laughs> That's what you get. If, if I change, <laughs> if I change Shifter in any fucking format. I'm winning. Fuck you. It would be a format of... Dude, Open your call by. It depends on the number of call by in that format. Is the only factor on if I'm losing. Guaranteed. I think call by was at three. Then you better open all time. fucking three because I guarantee I got three shifter. That'll make no sense, but it's going to make yeah. sense to those who love shifter. I'm just saying. If I open a shifter, I don't care what format <laughs> you're in. Pepe format. Fucking dragon ruler format i don't care you can you can have whatever i'm going to beat you you're not playing through the shifter unless you're like grand maju or flunder flunder can play through the shifter that's about it but if i'm chaining shifter and normal summoning rabina bro you're not winning that game there's, there's just no way you win that there's just no way no, he, we're just saying we're saying we're saying you're not even getting to play that you just get killed like your life points go to zero on my turn just one. look at like you know uh 2018 with danger dark world i mean you even if we didn't have shifter at the time but even if we did have shifter it wouldn't have stopped the burn otk for danger dark world yeah burns too you're wanting to unleash the kraken man and that is not good <laughs> bro i'm just saying let darwinism at its finest let let the meta resolve itself Activate Anarchy on Resolution Chaos. That's all I want. That's all I want. I'm not saying let's do it. I'm just saying if they were to do it, I'd be okay with it. I would. I wouldn't have no complaints if they get, if they gave us all painful choice at one. If they gave us all snatch steal at one. If they gave me my Helka Fibrax back at one. You know what I'm saying? If they gave me like all my fucking banned cards, people would want to build the craziest decks. And I feel as though they're gonna know that the FTKs are coming. And they're gonna somehow, like go like have cards that go against it. Because then, because not, we're already in a dice roll format. You know what I'm saying? Like so for that, side decks would just be so crucial. It wouldn't even be funny. But, it, but that's what I'm <laughs> saying. Like what, what would you side against? What, what would you side in against? Fucking people who are playing Pepe right now. What would you side in against people who are playing full power Zodiac right now? We're not full power, but everything's at one. You know what I'm saying? At the very least. So you know what I'm saying? Like what would you like what is the most generic side deck of all? To go against every card you're gonna see that you just can't say it. There's so many good what about like uh Drytron with three Ben Tens and three Eva? You know what I'm saying? Them niggas put up they might as well have put up an FTK. Oh I don't know, there's so much things that could happen that I don't think FTKs would be what everyone's kind of focusing on. But then again, putting up six negates and passing is an FTK within itself. So, you know, what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> Uh, you know what I love? I love Orange Light. See, exactly. You, you wouldn't want to play with Orange Light at three if they didn't print a new card for forever. But every other, but everyone else gets their Orange Lights at three. Maxi would be sweet to have back again. I played with that at one. Bro, Sprite, I would love Sprite. Sprite would be my favorite deck of all time. I love playing Sprite right now, or Abyssal Sprite, but with Maxi, it just gets ignorant. I love it. I would be Gigantiking out Maxi and turning it with Swap Frog so hard um what were we talking about before we got way off fucking track <laughs> antonio do you remember you were going into something and we just fucking we took off 
<laughs> yeah, so we were talking about the power creep, how, you know, specifically synchros, how, how they've changed, you know, I was going into how, you know, the first synchros, like Gen 1 synchros, Stardust, Black Rose, Goyo, like those were really busted at the time, but now we have, you know, this new Chaos synchro coming out, and we have Baron, and, you know, a lot of this stuff that, you know, revolves around, uh, like, you know, negating stuff, like, look at, like, all the Sword Soul synchros, and, you know, um, so yeah, you know, the power crap, the, the, the meta has shifted with the power crap and the dynamic has changed. So, um, and I don't know if it, you know, when is it going to break? I mean, we just keep on making things that are stronger and stronger and stronger to kind of push everything out of the way. Um, I don't really think that's a good system, like, for, like, longevity, but, I mean, for now, I mean, it's, it's all we're really getting, so uh, time will tell. I don't know, it's going to be interesting. I can agree. These are, we've all made some strong points tonight. That's all I'm gonna say. We've all we've all brought some anarchy. We've all brought a little bit of mischief. We've all brought a little bit of wildness, especially Dylan. <laughs> but just to wrap this up, we're just gonna end this here with saying thank you to our boys Antonio, aka the White Mexicans. So go check out his uh, YouTube channel. I'm gonna plug it into the description down below. Follow that. Follow that. Yep, follow that. Make sure to uh, go to Bubble Up Car Wash. They are a sponsor for the podcast. Clean that. Clean that. Yes, right. Yeah, clean that. Clean that up. We're, uh, shout out to Unplugged Gaming and uh, Joe, the store manager, for you know showing us love. Unplug that. Unplug that. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, also shout outs to all of you guys for listening and the Syracuse locals and all the boys and everything like that. And uh, is there anything else you want to say, Antonio, before we uh, close out? That is all. Thanks again for having me. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. It's been fun. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. All right, guys. We are out of life points. We'll catch you on the next episode. Again, this has been Dylan. And Player X. And we are... Semi-Limited.